In this video, we're gonna to start to unravel the mysteries of automating Meridian flips. A lot of times when you first take a stab at it, it just seems like it doesn't work and all the settings seem totally random and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But when we go through the content in this video and the follow-on videos specific to your imaging application, I hope you're gonna find that things aren't as mysterious and spooky as you think, and you're gonna get consistent and successful automated Meridian flips. So let's go ahead and look at some of the information that generally you're gonna to need to know when talking about automated Meridian flips. First thing I wanna talk about is why do we even care about the Meridian? And why is that even important to us? Can we just kind of do away with it? Uh, and I would suggest uh, for imaging applications, when you're trying to maximize the time that you have under the sky, probably you care a lot about the Meridian. The second thing is why do we care about automating Meridian flips? And it goes back to the point I just made, which is maximizing your time, but also you don't wanna be sitting at the scope freezing cold or outside if you don't absolutely have to. So a lot of the things that are happening lately around automation of uh, imaging sessions goes towards automating everything, including the Meridian flip. We're gonna cover the three must know insights that is going to help your understanding of how things work together and therefore increase your chances of success in doing the Meridian flips. And then finally, we're gonna talk about how to set up your Lost Mandy Gemini specifically around your limits and your Western go-to so that you have half the equation already done. So first let's talk about why the Meridian is important to us at all. Uh, and I've done a little diagram here. I've borrowed uh, some of the graphics from one of our customers, Edward Plummer, and he's a fantastic guy. He does a great uh, guest spot on our podcast talking about automating Meridian flips for Nina. So if you are going to be using Nina, that is an absolute must session on our podcast to go check out. And we'll put the link in down below. But I'm going to use some of his diagrams here and talk about the Meridian and the fact that it represents basically the best imaging conditions. So in this diagram you see here, we have just an example telescope here in the middle. We have the Eastern horizon on the left and the Western horizon on the right and just degrees in the sky in terms of uh, altitude. So there's uh, on the outside one here, it goes from zero up through 90 at uh, the Meridian or the Zenith is the example we're gonna use and then all the way over to 180 degrees on the western side. And then inside we have some gray numbers going from west at zero degrees, counting backwards. These are just two references that we're going to revisit about how to set uh, the limits in your Gemini, but we're gonna use those right now to explain what's going on. So the meridian represents really the best imaging conditions. And why is that? Well, this is because when you look at transparency and a related concept called extinction, directly above you at the meridian is where it has the least amount of atmosphere to image through. And the least amount of atmosphere means your targets are gonna be the brightest and the least susceptible to atmospheric conditions that will cause your images to be less sharp or uh, not as bright as they could be. So as an example, we're gonna talk about a um, measurement called air mass. And the air mass, sorry, the air mass at the zenith at where you are is going to be considered one air mass. And that is essentially uh, at sea level, it's gonna be 86% 80, of the brightness of that target. Now, why isn't it 100%? Well, we're shooting through atmosphere. So if we had a space telescope, it would be 100% brightness, but we have to shoot shoot through some amount of atmosphere. So in this case, you know, the best we could hope for at sea level is 86% brightness. Now that doesn't seem too bad, but then when you start to get down into lower altitudes, so at 30 degrees, a target above the horizon, this is gonna be the equivalent of two air masses. And now your target goes down to 74% brightness. So it's starting to drop in brightness as you shoot through more of the atmosphere. At 10 degrees, it's 5.6 air masses. And at the horizon, it's a huge 40 air masses. So your target, if you're shooting at the horizon, is gonna be 40% as bright as if you were shooting at the zenith. That is a huge number, and that really speaks to why we wanna maximize our time at the meridian, and in this example, at the zenith. 
So oftentimes when you talk about people who are imaging and really being thoughtful about this, they have a range they shoot around uh, the meridian. It could be you know 10 degrees on each side. It could be 30 degrees on each side. It could be all the way down to 45 degrees uh, altitude. So that is uh, you know 45 degrees on each side. Those equate to the number of hours that you would image on each side of your meridian. So typically what I hear from more advanced imagers is they wanna shoot no more than two hours on each side of the meridian to get the best possible imaging time with the least amount of atmosphere. So I use the terms meridian and zenith somewhat interchangeably, and that's not entirely true. The meridian is the invisible line from wherever you're standing that can be drawn from directly north to uh, up and overhead through the zenith to directly south. The zenith, of course, is the directly uh, straight up uh, above you. Now, in the ideal conditions, you would shoot your targets as they go through the zenith, but in reality, they're not all going to be going through the zenith, but they all will pass through the meridian at some point. So when we talk about maximizing our um, imaging quality by reducing the amount of atmosphere, we're really talking about when that target goes through the meridian, whatever angle or declination or uh, altitude it's gonna be. So sometimes your targets are gonna be lower in the sky. There's nothing you can do about that short of actually physically moving somewhere else. But you can maximize the atmosphere uh, disturbances, or sorry, minimize the atmospheric disturbance by shooting closer to the meridian because otherwise you're still running into other issues uh, around the transparency. So here in this example, we're just talking about different strategies and how people look at uh, the time they're gonna spend before and after the meridian when imaging. So now let's talk about why we need a meridian flip and it has to do with a German equatorial mount design. So in this example, we're shooting a target and it's starting out about 40 degrees in the eastern sky. And as we track it, it goes up to 60 degrees, everything's working fine. Hopefully our guiding is doing well, our tracking is doing well. And even at the meridian, everything seems to look pretty good. But at some point past this, we risk a potential peer crash where the camera uh, at the bottom of your telescope is gonna hit either the pier or the tripod. And of course, we don't want that to happen. So what we need the telescope to do is to flip around, still aiming at the same target, and acquire that same target and continue imaging into the western sky. And that's what's known as a meridian flip. And when it does this, then we can of course continue on to track that target into the western sky for as long as we like. And that is the meridian flip. And that is why with a German equatorial mount design, we need that meridian flip because we wanna maximize our time around the meridian, both in the eastern sky and the western sky. So now let's look at the three steps to setting up an automated meridian flip. And these are kind of, again, more visual understandings to these insights that we're talking about. So the first thing is, you need to set your Gemini limits and Western go-to limit. There's are three settings total in your Gemini that defines what I call the flip allowed range. So there's a range of time or a range of sky uh, angular values, but let's, let's consider it as time in which a flip, if the command is received, is going to be successful. The second thing is we are then going to use the imaging application and define those settings to create what I call a meridian flip request range. And this is the range of time or the range of sky angles that uh, the application is going to at some point request a meridian flip. The last important piece is we need to make sure, and this is our coordination, that the imaging app request range is well within the Gemini allowed range. And then we add a little bit of padding because there's always a little bit of inaccuracy in terms of what the, what the camera's doing, what the telescope is doing, um, so that we wanna make sure the imaging app request range has some padding around that, but is definitely within the Gemini allowed range. And if you think about that picture and how that looks, that's the thing that we are gonna be doing between the Gemini settings and your imaging app. Regardless of the specific imaging application you're going to use, you will need to set up your Gemini limits and configure them properly as we showed before. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and walk through an example of this. There's a video that we do that talks about how to set your limits specific to your telescope setup. And I'm gonna put a link in that down below in the description. You should walk through that process and make sure that the limits that you set are appropriate for your setup. You can't copy this from other people because limits themselves prevent peer crashes and are unique to your specific setup. So your telescope might be longer, it might be shorter, you might have a big camera, a small camera, all those things play a role in setting your limits. But I'm gonna give you a picture here showing you kind of the, the, the results of that particular video tutorial. The first thing we would do is we would set our Eastern limits by rotating the scope around. And again, this is all covered in this video tutorial, so don't worry that we're not covered the details here. But in this example, we're gonna set an Eastern limit at 100 degrees, and that's measured from zero degrees on the Western horizon. In the, in the actual setting of this, all you do is you just simply slew it and then you press the button set limit here. So you don't need to worry exactly about how these numbers are calculated, but I'm just showing you what this number means. It's 100 degrees from uh, the Western horizon, considering that to be zero degrees. So our Eastern position now is 100 degrees, our Eastern limit rather. Then the next thing we do is we set the Western position and that's going to be uh, in this example at 100 degrees. Of course, yours specifically is going to be unique to your telescope, but let's just use these as examples. This is measured from the Eastern horizon at zero degrees and it's gonna be about 10 degrees past uh, the meridian, which is considered to be 90 degrees or that line that goes directly from north to south. This is going to set one side of uh, the allowable range when we do the meridian flip. The last piece is we're gonna calculate the Western go-to limit. And this defines this, the other side of that range. And the way to think about this is you're gonna take that Western position and you're gonna subtract 90 degrees from it. And that's of course gonna be uh, the meridian itself and then we're gonna subtract an additional one just as a buffer. So in this case, if my Western position is 100 degrees, we're gonna remove 90, so that leaves me with 10 degrees, and we're gonna remove one just as a buffer, and that leaves me with a nine degree Western go-to limit, which is what I've demonstrated here. And what this creates is a flip allowable range in this example of 91 degrees in, in angular degrees to 100 degrees. Now, most of you probably know that one degree of uh, sky angle equals four minutes of clock time. So it takes four minutes to go one degree or at sidereal time to go one degree across in the sky. So if we do a quick calculation, those nine degrees are gonna be four to 40 minutes past the meridian. Now this is gonna be important because we had to do a little bit of translation when we get to the imaging application. It's probably gonna ask for things in terms of minutes past the meridian. So right now we know that our allowable range that we have just set up is four minutes past the meridian to 40 minutes past the meridian. So at this point, our Gemini is configured and ready to go and we have the information we need to set up our imaging application and coordinate those imaging app settings between the Gemini and the imaging app so that we know that this is going to work when we execute a meridian flip. The specific imaging application details and settings are gonna be different for each imaging application. Each one has its own kind of special version of the way that it does this, but they all basically have the same idea, which is defining a time in which you request the meridian flip. So in our subsequent videos, we're gonna cover some of these imaging applications and show you how to configure them so that it coordinates between the flip request range and the flip allowed range, and it's gonna be a successful meridian flip for you.